Okay, in this video we're going to look at the actual formal definition of the double integral. So what I have put here on the screen is the definition of the single integral from Calculus 1. So you've seen this many times, we've reviewed it a couple of times this semester already. Okay, so we just want to connect back to this idea from the single integral from Calculus 1, but think about the double integral for a function of two variables. So the first thing is that we need to start with a function f of x, y, and we need that function to be defined on a region. So in calculus one, the region that you had the function defined on was this interval from a to b, which is a closed and bounded interval. And so for this multivariable function, we basically want the same idea. We want this function to be defined on a closed and bounded region r. And that region r is the region that we're going to define our integral over. When we talk about a function being defined somewhere, we're talking about domain point. So that region r would be in the xy plane. We don't really need to state that. That's what it means when we talk about this function being defined on a region. Okay, and then the idea with the single integral was that once you had your function defined on an interval, you chopped that interval up into pieces. And so the formal language for that is we say that we are going to partition the region and we're going to partition R using an inner rectangular partition. So the idea with the inner rectangular partition is that we had in the last video with the Legos, we had a region and we chopped that up and all of the pieces we chopped that up into were inside our region R. They didn't go outside our region R. The reason for that is that the function may not be defined outside the region R. We require that our function is defined on the region R, but it may or may not be defined outside of R. So we want our pieces in the partition to be inside our region R. And for this part, we're going to start with an inner rectangular partition. So that basically means that the sides of the pieces in the partition are going to be parallel to the x and y axes. So we can talk about the dimensions of those little boxes as having a delta x and a delta y dimension. And so in our video before, we denoted those pieces in our partitions using subscripts R1 through, we did R6 in the Lego sculpture, uh, but in general here we'll say that our partition is a set of rectangles R1 up through Rn. So this is just an example of one of the RKs that I've drawn here in the partition. Okay, and then if you just think back to what we did with the Legos, once we chopped that region up into pieces, we picked a point in each of those pieces. So in each of the RK, we choose an XK, YK. All right, and then the reason we choose that point is so that we can use it to get a function output. When you look at the single integral, we just chose an x coordinate, we denoted that c sub k, but the idea there is that you choose a point in each piece and you use that to get a function output. All right, once we've got that function output, what we want to do is similar to what we did in the single integral, we want to be able to take that function output and multiply that times the size of the piece. So we need some notation to denote the size of the piece and we did that when we used the Legos. So we're just going to use the same notation here, we're going to let delta a sub k denote the area of the kth rectangle or of r sub k. And because I've drawn this picture here and labeled, we notice that that area can be written as a product uh, delta x sub k times delta y sub k or vice versa. That's just multiplication so the order doesn't matter there. Okay, and so then just like in the single integral, we want to take function output times size of piece, add them all up and take the limit as the norm of the partition approaches zero. So let's go ahead and talk about what that product is going to mean. In general, you could have negative outputs here. When we did it with the Lego sculptures, we just had positive outputs so that we could build that on top of my Lego base. But remember, we could have negative outputs here. And then this is the area of the base. And so we end up here with this product with really a signed volume. I don't want to just label this as volume because volume cannot be negative, but we could have a negative value here for the function output, so I'm going to put here signed volume of a box. Okay, so we formed those products and I just did a little bit of labeling there to kind of think about what those products actually represent and then we're going to add them all up. So what we have at that point is actually the Riemann sum and that's what we built with the Lego sculpture. 
that's just a sum. When we added up all those numbers in the boxes, this is what we had a value for. We had n equals 6 for ours. But I talked about in that video that when you think about the single integral, you should understand what you want to happen here. You want to get infinitely many little boxes and you want them to be infinitely small so that they fill up that whole region R. So in calculus one, you're basically just letting the widths all approach zero and the number approach infinity. You have to be careful not to just let the number approach infinity. Uh, if you think about a region, you could draw infinitely many little boxes just in here and still have some big boxes in another part. So it's not enough just to let n approach infinity. You need them also to get infinitely small. All right, so let's talk about some notation for that. Up here, I have the partition labeled P. And so we're next gonna talk about something about that partition. Uh, we're gonna use this symbol, which was used in calculus one as well. So it's like, looks like double absolute value bars. And that denotes the norm of the partition. And in calculus one, the norm of the partition was the width of the largest subinterval. Here we wanna describe the size of the largest piece and we essentially want that to approach zero. And remember that our pieces are boxes with two dimensions here, an x, delta xk and a delta yk, and we want the size of that box to approach zero. And so it's important to understand that you cannot just let the size of the areas approach zero. Uh, that would happen if only delta x approached zero or delta y approached zero, but not necessarily both. You want them both to approach zero. So one way to handle that is to let the norm of the partition be the length of the longest diagonal. And if that diagonal approaches zero, that will force both the delta x and the delta y sides to approach zero. So for this kind of partition, so for this kind of partition, we're gonna let that norm of that partition be the length of the longest diagonal. Okay, so we now wanna let the norm of that partition approach zero. And as we do that, we'll get the number of rectangles to also approach infinity. And when we do that, there are two things that have to happen in order for this to define the double integral that we're interested in over the region R of our function. We made two choices. One was how we partitioned. So provided this limit exists and is the same, for all choices of partition. And the other place we made a choice when we did this was we chose points x, k, y, k. So that limit also needs to be the same for all choices of the points. Notice the differential on the end of the double integral here. Because we have a delta a, k on our Riemann sum, the differential on the end of the double integral here is a dA instead of a dx or a dy. Now, when we thought about the rectangles, remembering that the area of the rectangle would be delta xk times delta yk, we sometimes see that dA replaced by a dx times dy or a dy times dx. We will look at some evaluation of double integrals in the next video and some theorems that help us rewrite that dA as a dx times dy or a dy times dx since this delta A we talked about before is delta xk times delta yk or delta yk times delta xk, whichever way we want to write that. Okay, okay here we're going to look on Calcplot 3D at what we've just defined and think about that definition of that double integral. So I've graphed the same function that we were working with when we worked on the Lego problems. So I've graphed z equals 5e to the negative 0.04x squared minus 0.04y squared. I had to change the window a little bit so that we would be able to see in the xy plane at least from negative 5 to 5 on the x and y directions. And then I had to change the z directions a little bit so that we could see the whole surface over that region. And uh, I'm gonna change just a little bit here to make the surface a little bit transparent so that we'll be able to see the Riemann sum rectangular prisms that we generate. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up here to where it says add to graph and I'm gonna choose region. And when you do this, you get a window here and you can type in a 2D top and 2D bottom for a region in the XY plane. So I'm gonna go ahead and type that in so that we get our circle of radius five that we were working with last time. Okay, so you can see here I have typed in where it says 2D top y equals and bottom y equals. I've typed the equations for a circle, solve for y, uh, and 
you can see the circle of radius 5 centered at the origin that we had up there. I'm going to go ahead and check this box so it will show that on the 3D surface going up to our surface. I also, for 3D top, typed our, our function equation that we're working with, 5 times e to the negative 0.04x squared minus 0.04y squared, and bottom f of xy equals 0. I'm going to check this next box that says show Riemann prisms. Once I check the box that says show Riemann prisms, you can see a couple of boxes that we have there. Uh, it's made four boxes in the x-direction and four in the y-direction. I'm going to change those to be a little bit more. So I've now changed that so I have 20 boxes in both the x and y directions. And so you can see that we have a graph that looks a lot like what we built with the Lego sculptures, but with much smaller rectangles and many more rectangular prisms. I'm going to go ahead and check one more thing here about show points used for heights so that we'll be able to see the points that were used to calculate the heights. The choice I've given here is height by midpoint. There are some other choices I could make, but we're going to go ahead and leave that at midpoint for right now. So you can see on the three-dimensional surface, the x, y, and z coordinate. Uh, so the x, y coordinate would have been chosen in the x, y plane, and then the z coordinate given by the function. And you can see down here volume of region at the bottom of my screen. There's an approximation there for volume of region. And so that shows that what we came up with before we had about 240 was not too bad considering we had only six rectangles and we've got a whole bunch more here. So the idea here would be that if you let the norm of that partition approach zero, you would end up with many, many more rectangles that fill in this whole circle and you should end up with more and more um, exact answer. We will look at being able to actually calculate the exact value of the volume of this particular region in some later videos, but that takes a little bit more knowledge before we're quite ready to do that.